There are policies previously, but I'm happy to look at any specific cases uh, she raises. If do it. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I ask my right honourable friend, when will a fiscal review of all offshore energy activity uh, be carried out to ensure we are maximising investment opportunities in critical energy infrastructure like offshore wind, carbon capture and storage, hydrogen, as well as, while we still need it, domestic oil and gas? Well, he's absolutely right to raise that. I actually had a breakfast with uh, clean energy industry representatives this morning to discuss their concerns. There is a huge amount of potential investment, and he's absolutely right to say that maximising the use of our own oil and gas reserves during transition is a vital part of our energy security policy. Caroline Lucas. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Will the Chancellor consider introducing a windfall tax on banks' excess profits? The profits of the big four banks for the first half of this year were up 700 per cent compared to 2020, yeah. yet the Bank of England is forecast to pay out as much as £42 billion of interest on reserves to banks in 2023, at the same time as the Government has cut the level of surcharge on banks' profits by 60 per cent. Minister. Yeah, Mr Speaker, with millions of British jobs dependent on financial services, including an estimated 20,000 jobs in Brighton and Hove, I hope the Honourable Lady would join me in celebrating a sustainably profitable financial sector. It is only that that gives us the ability to invest in skills and technology. Yeah. Yeah. To the Treasury Committee, Harriet Morwin. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Could the Economic Secretary update the House on the progress he's making to enable our constituents to access personalised financial guidance if they're part of the 93 per cent of uh, constituents who can't afford regulated financial advice? Minister. Well, my honourable friend and chair of the Treasury Select Committee makes a really important point about what's called the advice gap. Uh, Treasury officials, myself and the FCA, uh, are all consulting on that, and I'll be publishing an update this autumn. Richard Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's been revealed that Integrated uh, Debt Services, a company set up by the UK government to recover personal debt, saw its profits increase by a staggering 132% last year. Do ministers think it's right that this company should be able to profit to that extent out of the misery of the cost of living crisis? The, uh, the honourable gentleman is referring to a company that works uh, with the government's Crown Commercial Services. That works for debt across central government. Uh, and it, they are to operate within a very specific framework, uh, and indeed they are regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority. Uh, I very much understand the point he has raised, and I will be making inquiries on that point myself. R&D tax credits are vital to help yeah. businesses grow and invest, but I have received a large number of complaints from businesses across Essex saying that they are facing complexities and delays in processing claims with HMRC. Um, may I please ask the Minister to meet with me and some of these businesses to actually work through these delays and ensure that these businesses can continue to thrive and grow because they are vital to our economic growth? I would be delighted to meet my right honourable friend uh, and the businesses she sets out. In fact, the UK is leading uh, world economies with our focus on life sciences and on tech. In that little golden triangle between Oxford, Cambridge and London, we have more tech businesses on the planet than anywhere else other than New York and Silicon Valley. I hear the cheers opposite, so keen are they to uh, support British business. But, uh, the, but uh, I'd be delighted to meet her and to absolutely underline the support that this government gives to such important uh, businesses. I welcome the new focus on engaging pension funds with productive uh, investment after many years when regulation has pushed the funds into government gilts instead. But does the Minister have proposals specifically to secure those investments for UK businesses rather than going overseas? Minister. Uh, well, uh, the, the, the Honourable Member um, makes uh, a, a significant contribution to the debate about the nation's pension funds. Uh, our objective to increase investment, both to drive increased returns for pension savers, but also to the benefit of the wider economy, stop short of mandating. There is a philosophical difference uh, between this side of the House uh, and the opposition. Uh, we don't believe it's right for the Chancellor to tell pension funds where to invest, but it is our job to knock down barriers, frictions and impedances to pension funds investing in the brilliant British companies. David Davis. The Minister just told my honourable friend that he's going to underwrite the statutory right to access to cash, but 6,000 bank branches will have closed by the end of the year, leaving only 4,000 in place. 15,000 ATMs have closed in the last five years. How is he going to make sure this actually happens rather than just an empty promise? Yeah. 
Um, the FCA have significant sanctions in respect of uh, the closure of ATMs that would leave those communities without the right of free access to cash. Uh, in terms of the closure of bank branches, we are seeing a very significant change. And I hope uh, my honourable friend would respect the fact that technology is changing, consumer patterns are changing. During the recess, I had the privilege of visiting the excellent uh, community banking hub in Brixham. I think that's a brilliant opportunity. There should be more than 100 on their way, and it's my objective to. That many people look at income tax rates at the moment as being exceptionally punitive, and would he also accept that there is a need quickly as possible to move into a growth-based economy and supercharge our economy in the United Kingdom? Well, as a Conservative, I want to bring taxes down as soon as we can afford to do so, and I'm very proud that for the first time ever you can earn £1,000 a month without paying a penny of yeah. tax or national insurance. Yeah. Bob Blackman. <laughs> Speaker. As we want to expand our financial services industry, not only in this country but abroad, we need to build confidence amongst consumers that it's the right thing to do to invest. So does my honourable friend agree with me that it's absolutely vital that the regulators respond and deal with complaints to them and actually impose sanctions against those that breach them? Minister. Yes, I agree with my honourable friend on this matter. It's one reason why we have beefed up the role of the Financial Regulators Review Commissioner. Another is that we'll be requiring the regulators to publish regular operating metrics on their performance to give consumers the trust they need. Next, man. Mr Speaker, back in 2017, both the Treasury and the Financial Conduct Authority knew there were problems with the prepaid funeral plan market. Since then, my constituent, Gary Godwin of Nanty Glow, lost over £6,000 to the collapse of a company called Safe Hands. Across the UK, thousands more have lost millions altogether. So can I ask the Minister, will he please meet with me to discuss the scandal and Mr Godwin's case? Minister. Yes, uh, I'll be very happy to meet with my mum and friend. What happened in Safe Hands is a scandal, and that is why we have enlarged the regulatory perimeter to bring those who seek to sell funeral plans within the regulatory conduct. Stephen Crabb. Speaker, over the summer, ports have been bidding into the government's infrastructure fund to help them get ready for the delivery of the new floating offshore wind industry. Could I encourage ministers to look favourably on the bids from the Celtic Sea ports of Milford Haven and Port Talbot, because those two ports are key to unlocking the enormous economic benefits of this new clean energy industry? Chancellor. I'm absolutely happy to do that, and I agree with him about the enormous potential of those areas. Daisy Cooper. Mr Speaker, uh, some GP practices are at risk of being um, priced out of city centres, including in places like St Albans, because of outdated Treasury rules that prevent ICBs from spending the money they want to on a GP practice location. Um, health ministers have confirmed to me that their officials are happy to work with Treasury officials. Could I please ask for a personal assurance from Treasury ministers that you will encourage your officials to look at this and resolve it um, absolute latest by the end of this year? Start. Dialogue is ongoing on this matter, and I can, can confirm that we will continue to work on this in the coming weeks. Bato. Speaker, Andy Haldane, the former Bank of England chief economist, recently said in a Sky News interview that the Bank of England kept on printing money for longer than it needed to. It's clear that central banks across the world have been addicted to cheap money, and this has contributed to inflation across the world. Does the Chancellor agree with me that printing cheap and, uh, cheap and easy money has not been without consequence? Instead, our monetary policy must focus on important growth factors like productivity. But, Chancellor. Well, I, I do agree with what he says, and all I would say is the Bank of England themselves have said that there were problems with their inflation forecasting. Uh, they are learning the lessons from that, and we must support them every step of the way as they bring down inflation. British Air. Speaker, sorry I was late today. British Airways cancelled my flight. Uh, can I ask the Chancellor that when the, his predecessor, the now Prime Minister, <laughs> was Prime Minister, there was huge fraud for the bounce back loans? Has he got any of that money back yet? We are always ferociously determined to recover money uh, that is obtained through fraud. Um, but because of those bounce back loans, we have the fastest recovery of any major European country. Final question, Jem Sundlum. Mr. Speaker, thank you. I have recently been contacted by several self employed constituents in Bracknell expressing concern about heavy fines being imposed for filing tax returns late, even though no monies are owed. Mm. Would the Treasury please agree to meet with me with a view perhaps to reviewing this policy? Mm. Yeah. Minister. Uh, 
I will, of course, be happy to meet my honourable friend. I, I hope he understands I can't intervene personally in any case, but I will, of course, look at the uh, general principle and see if there are systemic issues here that he um, sets out. Right, that completes questions. Let those leave before we come to the next part. Yeah. Right, let us come to the next part. We have the urgent question, Caroline Lucas. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. To ask the Secretary of State for levelling up housing and communities uh, if they'll make a statement on the Government's decision to use the levelling up and regeneration bill to scrap environmental protections on nutrient neutrality. Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, Mr Speaker, the Secretary of State for Levelling Up tabled a written ministerial statement yesterday on the Government's plans, but I am happy to provide an update to the House. In proposing these amendments, we are responding to calls from local... Sir, it is very good of you to offer to do that update. I decided it was an urgent question. I expect ministers to come, so I did not think a, a written ministerial statement was the way to inform the House. Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I'm delighted to be here to, put, to uh, answer this urgent question. Um, in proposing these amendments, we're responding to calls from local councils who want the government to take action to allow them to deliver the homes their communities need. At present, legacy EU laws on nutrient neutrality are blocking the delivery of new homes, including cases where planning permission has already been granted. This has affected home building of all types from the redevelopment of empty spaces above high street shops to affordable housing schemes to new care homes and families building their own home. The block on building is hampering local economies and threatening to put SME local builders out of business. Nutrients entering our rivers are a real problem, but the contribution made by new homes is very small compared with that from other sources, such as industry, agriculture and our existing housing stock, and the judgment so far has done very little to achieve and to improve water quality. We are already taking action across government to mandate water companies to improve their wastewater treatment works to the highest technically achievable limits. Those provisions alone will more than offset the nutrients expected from new housing developments. But we need to go further, faster, which is why, as well as proposing targeted amendments to the Habitat's regulations, the Government is committing to a package of environmental measures. Central to this is £280 million of funding to Natural England to deliver strategic mitigation which is sufficient to offset the very small amount of additional nutrient discharge attributable to up to 100,000 homes between now and 2030. And we have also announced more than £200 million for slurry management and agricultural innovation in nutrient management and a commitment to accelerate protected site strategies in the most affected catchments. In our overall approach, there will be no loss of environmental outcomes and we are confident our package of measures will improve the environment. Nutrient neutrality, Mr Speaker, was only ever an interim solution. With funding in place and by putting these sites on a trajectory to recovery, we'll fe we feel confident in making this legislative intervention. Caroline Lucas. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I must say I find it quite extraordinary that the Minister can stand there and make that statement with a straight face. Over the past eight years, ministers have stood at that dispatch box and promised time and again that leaving the European Union would not lead to a weakening of environmental standards. Those of us who raised our concerns have been repeatedly told that we were scaremongering. As recently as the 12th of June, the Solicitor General said we will not lower environmental protections in relation to the retained EU Law Act. Yet here we have it. Proposals to unpick the Habitats Directive and disapply the nutrient neutrality rules which protect our precious rivers and sensitive ecosystems. Proposals which the Office for Environmental Protection itself has made clear would, and I quote, demonstrably reduce the level of environmental protection provided for in existing environmental laws. They are a regression, and I would just underline that to the Minister chuntering from his seat on the front bench. Proposals which go directly against the polluter pays principle by forcing the taxpayer rather than house builders to foot the bill in mitigating increased water pollution from house building in environmentally sensitive areas. And what is particularly infuriating is that, as the name suggests, 
the nutrient neutrality rules weren't even about improving our environment, they were simply about trying to prevent pollution from getting worse. Mm. So let me ask the Minister some important questions. On transparency, will the Government now follow the OEP's call for them to make a statement, as required by Section 20.4 of the Environment Act, admitting that they can no longer say that the levelling up bill would not reduce environmental protections in law? Will the Minister explain how the Government will meet its objectives for water quality and protected site condition when it is at the same time weakening environmental law? What advice did Ministers receive from Natural England before these amendments were tabled? Will she explain why there has been a complete lack of consultation with environment groups? And will she also explain what consultation there was with house builders, whom we will have noticed are cock a hoop about the announcement and the subsequent boost to their share prices? Will she admit that it is a false choice to pit house building against environmental protection when there are successful projects underway to address nutrient pollution? Will the government provide evidence to their unsubstantiated claim that 100,000 homes are being delayed as a consequence of these rules? And will she recognise that money, which can easily be taken away at a later stage, is not the same as a legal requirement to stop pollution getting into our rivers? Thank you, Mr Speaker. Well, I thank the Honourable Lady for her uh, long list of questions, and I'm very happy to respond to all of them in detail. Uh, our approach, and I stand by what I said and what the Government has said, we stand by our pledges to the environment, and we do not accept, as she stated, that we will weaken our commitment to the environment at all. It is important to consider what we are talking about here, which is unblocking 100,000 homes which add very, very little in terms of pollution. But our approach, to be very clear, means there will be no overall loss to environmental outcomes. The measures we are taking not only address the small, very small amount of nutrient runoff from new housing, but we are investing at the same time in the improve, improvement of environmental outcomes. And we don't agree that this is regression on environmental standards. We're taking direct action to continue to protect the environment and make sure that housing can be brought forward in areas where people need it. She asked about engagement. Of course, ministers uh, across government and myself and Secretary of State have had numerous meetings with all parties in involved, and we have had meetings with environment groups uh, as part of government business. And I think it's worth also the House noting that the very significant steps that DEFRA colleagues are taking in terms of enforcement on the water companies. Since 2015, the Environment Agency have concluded 59 prosecutions against water and sewage companies, securing £150 million pounds in fines, and the regulators have recently launched the largest criminal and civil investigations into water company sewage. We are taking action against water companies to protect our rivers, leave the environment in a better state than we found it, and build the houses, affordable houses, that the country so desperately needs, including in her constituency. Philip Dunn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, I am sure the Minister will recognise that I and many other colleagues on this side of the House share the admirable objectives of the Honourable Lady for Brighton Pavilion in ensuring that our water quality of our rivers is improved year by year under this Government and its successors. The, the proposals that she has made to amend the Levelling Up and Regeneration Bill are not about damaging the status of our rivers. As I understand it, they are dealing with a particular and very specific uh, interpretation of the EU Habitats Directive by the European Court of Justice in connection with a case in Holland prior to the time when we left the EU. If that is the case, she's mentioned, referred to the mitigation measures that she's undertaken. Does she agree with me that in areas of special areas of conservation, such as the River Clun catchment in my constituency, where there has been no planning consent granted for nine years, that these measures uh, uh, will help to unlock that while preserving the quality of the river in the, in the Clun catchment? You've taken longer than the I thank the right honourable gentleman very much, and he's absolutely right in his observation that this has been a judgment imposed on the United Kingdom after we left the European Union. This is not a long-standing convention um, in any shape or form, and he's right to make those observations. And he's also right to highlight the uh, protections that we're putting in place to protect the, our rivers and the environment more broadly. And we are also putting in place a substantial package of measures to help farmers sustain, uh, farm more sustainably, to manage their slurry infrastructure more effectively, and to be able to drive that circular economy 
in farming, which we all want. He mentions the specific catchments uh, in his area, and I know that we have committed to bring forward a, a Y uh, catchment plan very shortly, which I hope will addre address the issues he's referring to. Clyde Betts. I'm happy to go with that. No, no, no. It took so long, I thought we must have moved on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As a result of the Government's failure over many years to make decisive progress in tackling the main sources of problem nutrients, namely farming and wastewater treatment works, the requirements for nutrient neutrality in sensitive river catchments do present a challenge to securing planning permission for new housing development. It is therefore right in our view that the operation of the rules around nutrient neutrality are reviewed with a view to addressing problematic delays and increasing the pace at which homes can be delivered in these areas. However, we have serious concerns about the approach the Government have decided upon. Not only does it involve disapplying the conservation of habitats and species regulations, but it does not legally secure the additional funding pledges to deliver nutrient management programmes and does not provide for a legal mechanism to ensure housing developers contribute towards mitigation. I put the following questions to the Minister. What advice did the Government receive from Natural England with regard to potential reform of the laws around nutrient neutrality, and did they offer a view on the Government's proposed approach? Given the amount of mitigation that is currently available in the pipeline, estimated at allowing for approximately 72,000 homes, did the Government consider an approach based on the Habitat Regulations Assessment derogation and a revised credit mitigation system to front-load permissions and provide for future compensatory schemes? If so, why did it dismiss that option? What assessment has the Government made about the impact of its proposed approach on the nascent market in mitigation credits and investor confidence in nature markets more generally? Why on earth do ministers believe developers will voluntarily contribute to mitigation under the proposed approach? And finally, Mr Speaker, the Government claims its approach will see 100,000 planning permissions expedited between now and 2030. Given the fact that house building activity is falling sharply and the pipeline for future development is being squeezed, not least as a result of housing and planning policy decisions made by this Conservative Government, what assessment has the Department made of the number of permissions that its disruptive approach will unlock within the first 12 months of its operation? Yeah. Minister. Thank the Honourable Gentleman for his uh, questions and his remarks. I, I take it to mean that he will be supporting these measures when they come before uh, the House of...